The message today is about God's order versus the new world order. Now there are three and only three covenant institutions that God put on the earth. What are they? Thank you, marriage. All right, so let's just say family. Out of that marriage comes a whole family. Family is a covenant relationship. What else? Thank you, the church. The church is a covenant institution. Can you say that? That's a mouthful. The church is a covenant institution. Nice, I like that. So I put a church there. This is a pretty modern looking church. What's the last one? Government. Wow, these are experts. I think there are no newbies here. These are all the experts in this church right here. Now, what are the differences between these three? It's very important to know the differences and the mandate that God has given to each of them. Let's start on the negative side. The state cannot make money. Did you know that? We're used to the state printing money, but they're not allowed just to print money out of nowhere. There has to be productivity. It has to match the productivity. The state doesn't produce any wealth. Isn't that interesting? Who produces the wealth? You, the family. And you do it to feed the family. As soon as you get a kid, I bet you your productivity goes up. There's no other way. You do or you die. Is that right? The family creates wealth. How important is the family? It's the engine of prosperity in our lives, the family. They've done many studies where singles are not as prosperous, or they say singles are poorer than married people. In every way, not just financially, but in every way, mentally, emotionally, in all sorts of ways. There's something about the mandate of God upon families, and that's why Satan attacks it. All right, the state cannot produce morals. Have you noticed that? The state is not even interested. You would think the politicians are not even interested in morals. Isn't that right? And they make laws that are sometimes contradictory, self-contradictory laws. You can't do that and be moral. And the courts sometimes make judgments that we would find by biblical standards completely immoral. And that's been the history of the state's judicial system for hundreds and hundreds of years. You know, they killed uh, so many people by the court and imprisoned people like Nelson and Mandela. All that's by the court. That wasn't just done, you know, illegitimately. It was done by state power. So the state cannot make morals. Well, who does? Only the church. Now think about that. The only institution in the world right now that is interested interested in good and evil, right and wrong, morals. You're sitting in it. No one else cares, unless it affects them. Of course, then they care. But otherwise, who's spending the time to explain good character, good behavior to our children? It's the church, right? The state cannot just make up morals. When they do, they're self-contradictory. The church has a mandate from God. So we can put it this way. Economic sovereignty belongs to the family. Now, it's a very long way to say it, but it's quite powerful. Economic sovereignty belongs to the family. You have a right to keep what you earn. It should be a right, shouldn't it? It's economic sovereignty. And then we can say this. Judicial sovereignty belongs to the church. Again, it's a very maybe flowery way to say it, but it's a powerful way to say that if you want judgment to be passed, if you want correct judgment to be passed for you, when there's conflict between you and another human being, the most qualified institution in the world is the church. Now, all of these institutions have failings, but if you speak about the mandate that is on each of them, what they're supposed to do if they do it right, Judicial sovereignty belongs to the church. Your life would be full of justice and peace if you submitted yourself to the authority of the Word of God administered by the church. Everything would change. You wouldn't have all of these injustices. So what does the state do? The state can't produce wealth. The state can't produce morals. The state can't produce babies. The state can't do very much. What, what is the state's role? The state exists to protect the sovereignty of the other two. 
You see, we forget all that. If we don't come to church today, we wouldn't know. If you don't turn on YouTube today, you wouldn't know. You would think that the state has a mandate for everything. But this is a modern aberration. Let's look at an overview of evil society. How does society become evil? An institution has rights, that has rights, must have the right to defend itself. Otherwise, you don't really have rights. You say, I have a right to my property, but somebody can just walk out with a gun and steal your farm. Well, you don't really have a right anymore, do you? So you must have a right to defend yourself. Throughout history, the family, the church, and the state could defend itself from enemies. It's always been the case. In the old days, I guess if some, you know, invading army comes in, the family would have equal force. The father would have equal sword, and by the time they had guns, would have equal gun power to fend off anyone. And this is how the American Revolution succeeded. When they said the state was encroaching on the church, which was the main complaint, and on the family, their second complaint, they just grabbed their own guns and said, England, if you want to fight, we're fighting toe-to-toe, -to -toe, equal power to equal power. And they won. They, the family could defend itself. The church could defend itself. The church sometimes had invasions of Islam came in and completely took over Christian cities. The church had the power, without asking anyone else's permission, to go and push back the Islamic invading forces. This is, you know, many, many wars in history. The family had the power, the church had the power, and the state obviously had the power. If one state invades another state, then, you know, like China, if they're afraid Mongolia is going to invade them, then they have the right to build a wall, they have a right to climb the wall and throw spears and fire bombs and whatever else at, at, at the invaders. So this was always the case until now. We live in modernity, and now only the state has the right to use force. It's a very interesting situation right now. As the family and the church loses its right to defend itself, power is gradually transferred to the state. That means that there's no neutral ground. A lot of people think, well, if the church is weak, if I don't tie to the church, if I don't support the church, it doesn't matter. It's just that one church. Actually, there's, there's no neutral place. If the church does not carry out its mandate, if the church doesn't have the support of its own citizens, then you will transfer power to a rival institution. And right now, it's the state. The final stage is for the power of the nation states to transfer to a one-world government. And that's called, by George, late George Bush's own words, the New World Order. How will that happen? There has to be a final transfer. There's another institution that's holding power. It's the nation state. And you will see now that there is a crisis of nation states. It is currently not fashionable to say anything I've just said. It's probably offensive to some of you. It's not fashionable to affirm the centrality of the church and its morals and its sacraments. We have a monopoly on the sacraments. Can you imagine, I said this before, if you allow the state to take our monopoly, which they took on marriage, the reason we lost marriage is because it was our monopoly and we conceded it. There's no right. They're, they're not, they don't even care about marriage. Look at the divorce rate. They don't care about marriage. God made marriage. The only reason people get married is because God instituted marriage. It's our sacrament. But they took it and said, well, you can keep it in your church, but we'll also uh, have our secular marriage. Which then secular people say, oh, it's just a piece of paper. You see, you dilute the mandate, then you dilute everything. Now, what would happen if we gave up the rest of our monopolies? What if one day the state says, you know what? You can get baptized by the state. Wouldn't be far-fetched because we've given up everything else because we don't care about the church. We don't even attend church. The secular state knows it. When you say, well, the church says this, the state says, how much contribution, how much money does the church have? If the Rockefeller Foundation said something, 
We want things this way, the politicians say, yes, sir, Rockefeller Foundation, because they got money to back it up. Why doesn't the church have any money to back up what they want, what we want? Because most of the church are covenant breakers, not tithing. What would happen if the church said, we could make a million dollar contribution to this? Oh, yes, sir. What would you like, church? Money talks, everybody else walks. Don't get all spiritual. Don't get all spiritual. How, how do we establish this mandate on the earth? It takes money, doesn't it? But we conceded this to only the state collects money. Four times the rate allowed. And we say, no, the, the church has no right. One day, I bet you, the state's going to want to serve secular communion. They're trying to steal every mandate, every monopoly that belongs only to the church. Already took marriage. And they want other clubs, right? Because people need to get together. They create all sorts of clubs. That's taking away the, the fellowship of the saints, substituting it with something else. Now, Marxists affirm instead the centrality of the state. If you don't affirm the centrality of the church in your life, you affirm the centrality of the state. And the fact is this. This is for everyone to apply to your life. If you do not serve the Lord in this church, I understand many people listening to me, you're probably scratching your head. I don't know this is the first time I heard this. I understand. But mark my words. If you won't serve the Lord and the church, you will increasingly serve the state with your time, your talent, your taxes, and your obedience. And the, church, uh, the state is now the only institution left with the power of force, with the authority to force you at a gunpoint to do what it wants. So when politicians say something, you're looking at jail time or the barrel of a gun. Why? Because when God says something, we refuse to listen. Say, so, well, it's my choice. God said it. It's my choice. I don't have to agree with God. I'm telling you there are consequences to our faith. There are consequences to the way we treat the church. So I'm asking everyone that's listening, if you don't belong in the church, make this your church home. I'm not even going to ask you to pray about it. We know that we're teaching you good things and God brought you here. Make this your church home. And if you don't have a church because you don't even know Jesus, then make Jesus your Lord. Make Jesus your Lord. Church is His idea. Salvation is His gift. You can't make it up your own way. He says, if anybody would believe in Him, Jesus Christ, He will give them eternal life. So if you're not Christian yet, I want to ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes, and pray a sincere prayer to God. And then I'll talk to the rest of the church. We're almost done. The state created nothing for you. God created everything. Would you give your life to God, not the state? If you will, say this prayer to Him. Dear Heavenly Father, I submit to your authority. You are sovereign over my life. I'm sorry for rebelling against you, for speaking against the church, or any of its leadership. I ask you to forgive me and cleanse me from my sins. Thank you for Jesus dying on the cross for me. I believe he rose again on the third day so I can have new life, so I can belong to the church, so I can be part of something greater than me, myself. I give my life to you unreservedly. Use my life. Make me a credit for the kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I'm so glad if you prayed that for the first time, you just became a born-again Christian. God says that's all you need to do. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus died and rose again for you, you shall be saved.